Welcome to Booked, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livia Snedden. This week, we are going back to the Les Edgerton well, um, which, you know, probably sounds weird. But after reading this book, I'm concerned about what that well would actually look like if there was a Les Edgerton well. I can't imagine that it would be a well we'd want to drink from. It's a scary well. For sure. It is. <laughs> I mean, no wells were hurt in the making of this book that we're going to talk about, Hard Times. Here is Les Edgerton's bio. He is the author of more than 20 books as well as numerous short stories and screenplays. His work has been nominated for or awarded the Pushcart Prize, O. Henry Award, Penn Faulkner Award, Derringer Award, Spine Tingler Magazine Thriller of the Year, Jesse Jones Book Award, Edgar Allan Poe Award, Violet Crown Book Award, the Nickel Foundation Script Writing Awards, and the Best of Austin and Writers Guild Screenwriting Awards. An acclaimed and award-winning former hairstylist and television fashion program host, he now teaches creative writing courses at many universities and professional writing programs. He also served two years at the Pendleton Correctional Facility on a burglary conviction in the 1960s. He is completely reformed now, and you can and have him over for dinner at your house and won't have to count the silverware when he leaves. I want to say, we've talked to Les a few times. We've reviewed, you might know, off the top of your head, three, four of his books. This is the fourth, yeah. Um, he has the best bio. I mean, it's a little it's a little lengthy in the awards portion, but I don't think I've read another bio that makes me kind of smile. And we've read this bio several times, like this one does. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, the books we we uh, reviewed his book, The Rapist, um, Bomb, Adrenaline Junkie, which is a, a memoir, which is one of our few forays. I think it's our only foray into memoir reviews. Uh, no, there was um, Liar by Rob Roberge. My apologies. Um, and then this one. So uh, we we yeah, and we've known Les for years and years, and he is by far the nicest and most gracious ex-con i've ever hung out with i'm gonna say for sure <laughs> knowingly. knowingly knowingly hung out with yeah yes, <laughs> that's exactly. a good point because people don't usually like necessarily volunteer that information like oh hey i served time um so but we are here to talk about hard times uh the book that actually released uh today as we are recording this tuesday december 8th um Here's the synopsis. In, in 1930s East Texas, 14-year-old Amelia, help me out, Livius, Lasalt. I will go with Lasalt. Lasalt? I think so. Sure. Uh, it's the only time it's, we're going to say it, so we'll just go with that. Uh, Amelia Lasalt's father insists she marry Arnold Critchen, a local boy who assaulted her on their first date. When Arnold's alcohol-fueled brutality devastates their family, his ineptitude with crops destroys their farm, and his poorly run moonshine business lands him in prison, Amelia struggles to feed her four children as the depression worsens and a secret from her past looms large. 300 miles away, Lucius Tremaine tangles with a white police officer. Fleeing to Houston, a second altercation leaves him with a gunshot wound. Desperate and weak, he makes his way into the backwoods. As Lucius encounters increasing obstacles and Amelia's challenges escalate with Arnold's return from prison and a visit from her first love, who is now the local sheriff, an explosion looms. Will Lucius make it to Houston? Can Amelia save her children from both starvation and Arnold's increasing vengeful violence? As the odds stack up and the food runs out, Amelia must summon all her courage, strength, and ingenuity to attempt to save her family. I think that synopsis does a pretty good job of summing up this book. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, as far as the synopsis goes, this one's pretty good. It, it it does it doesn't necessarily hint to the tone, although like it, the the perceptive reader will notice that there's a lot of kind of grim shit mentioned. So uh, yeah, that's that's kind of the the a heavy tone of of grimness in this book. I sent Rob a message. I was not even halfway into this book. And uh, I'm going to read you the message. It says, this book is fucked up. There's my review. Keep reading. So we'll go a little bit deeper than that on this particular review. But that still stands as my summation for this book. This book is <laughs> fucked up. 
Yeah. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll hit the traditional kind of kickoff. Um, the book starts. Here's what I'll say. I'm going to acknowledge the fact that the book starts, like it says in the synopsis, with a 14-year-old Amelia. Um, but over it covers years. Um, obviously, at some point it says she's trying to save her family, uh, her children. Um, so this, this book covers uh, multiple decades of her life. And it doesn't go into great detail through the whole thing, but it's it skips around and everything. Like at one point, it kind of jumps to her being um, a, a mother of multiple children. But uh starts out when she's 14. She had just uh, won an award in class for, for being the best at her multiplication tables in the third grade. And so she got this little certificate and a pen that was inscribed with the words, the pen is mightier than the sword. She's all proud of herself. She's walking home. She gets ambushed by a classmate, this kid, who's like a real asshole. And he t- he tears up her certificate. I think he punched her, too. I'm pretty sure he just straight up decked her. Um, she goes home, shows her mom the certificate. The mom's proud of her. Shows her dad. The dad's like, well, you're done with school. Because essentially, uh, apparently in the 1930s in East Texas... Um, education wasn't necessarily as useful as um if you were a girl the goal was to get a good husband and they they were a farming family so the idea was your ideal mate your ideal life would be you hook up with a good farmer like a boy who's a good farmer and that's that's what your life should be so you shouldn't be dealing with frivolous stuff like being smart with math yeah and i'm gonna go a little bit uh, farther on that i think because uh, arnold who she winds up marrying, who's also the kid who tore up her, her certificate. Uh, it kind of goes through the same thing. I think that um, in that time, I think that if you came from a farming community, you know, and lived with a farming family, that that was it. That was the plan for you. I, I would imagine the vast majority of kids weren't encouraged to higher education. They were encouraged to stay on and help with the farm. And then they'd inherit the farm and then they would have children to have them work the farm. So, I mean, I've, I've, read and it heard and i'm sure we've seen it in movies too that whole thing about like having more kids so you have more help on the farm kind of situation so again anybody who's able to escape that uh through education and and not necessarily escape farming like that's the worst thing in the world but anybody who did get away from that um it, it's probably fewer than you know you would think yeah for sure uh, and and so that's what her life starts out as in this book. Um, she's told basically early on just to try and stay out of the way and don't speak up and do what you're told. And um, your life is you're a farmer, so you help on the farm. And, uh, you know, the book doesn't spend a ton of time on her kind of childhood. And the next real big thing that happens is there's a boy, kind of like the first boy in her life, um, that his parents move into the neighboring farm, but they're not farmers. Um, they're kind of more like, the, you know, uh, artists. And so artsy city types. Yeah. yeah city yep. folk artists. And um, so naturally her parents don't care for them at all. But like the boy comes around cause they're neighbors and, you know, they strike up a conversation. She thinks he's, you know, funny and stuff. The dad finds out and he's like, you get the hell out of here, you crazy hippie. And he didn't say that, obviously, but that was the um, that was the the feeling behind it. And uh, so despite her her parents not wanting her to have anything to do with uh, this boy, Billy, she kind of starts a clandestine relationship with him where they go they go out and they talk and eventually like they get to humping Um and uh <laughs> so like she's got herself a boyfriend but uh the dad kind of catches wind that he's been sneaking around and puts the kibosh on that all right then here we move into <clears throat> sentence number two of the synopsis um so the kibosh is put on it um but but the the the, the crowning uh, moment of that is uh, arnold Critchen, who's mentioned in the synopsis uh, comes around asking for her to uh, to to be his date to to the dance, and and uh, he he sexually assaults her after the dance. Um, that to, to make a long story short, that leads to um, a pregnancy, and that's it. They are uh, she gets hitched with the Christian, hitching Christian. 
Hitchin Critchin. The, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So then she's, and then that's where, like, when the, the kind of shotgun wedding happens uh, is when she really, her life of, of the don't get in the way, don't say anything, try not to be a bother, just be be a, a farm wife uh, really kicks in and it, it's 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 just, it's a dark thing to read like she's treated not like a human really much and um her whole purpose is just keep house raise the kid help with the farming um and you know you don't have any choice about when you want to have sex it's just that's that's what that's what you're there for like it's your your wife your duty as a wife and so they keep having kids because that's that's just kind of how it was at the time is it's it's a real dark real dire <laughs> kind of start to the book because it's just it's not a happy life for a young woman in a uh, texas farming family so this book starts in the 1930s um and i just want to want to make a note that in in reading this book and, and this is the only thing i've ever been exposed to that's like this i know it doesn't come up often on the podcast but I, i'm romanian um, and I, I've been to Romania a few times. Uh, the last time was in the late 80s, mid to late 80s. Um, and the village that my parents are from, that that's essentially what I pictured. I mean, the, these people are much closer together. Everyone has a neighbor, you know, multiple neighbors, a little street full of houses kind of thing. But everybody has that little plot of land. And I felt like, um, you know, we think this is so long ago, but but for for, you know, my people, saying that with a little bit of smirk on my face for my people um you know 35 years ago 40 years ago this 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 type of thing was a was a reality the everybody works the 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 little bit of land that you have for for the crops you know when women kind of had their place uh which was uh significantly below the place of the man in the house and and th that's kind of what i was drawing on from my own personal ex experience when i was reading this not necessarily that i think there was a ton of like you know super rapey stuff that happened but i wouldn't be really surprised if if there was so this seems really far out and and i think in some ways we read this kind of stuff and you go yeah was it really like that i you know what i i don't know what the 1930s or 40s were in east texas but i i feel like this might be a fairly genuine representation yeah and and i don't know the extent of um less's experience but um he did i'm not saying he grew up during the depression in texas but he did spend uh, a part of his his life in texas and he has family that was uh in texas i think the grandmother that he thanks at the beginning of the book uh lived in texas if i remember from his memoir correctly but i could be wrong um so at, at the very least you know he could have you know been aware of, uh, of like how farming communities were um you know in that time based on like you know his family history of being in that you know being in texas i don't know if it's east texas but he might have some kind of secondhand knowledge or you know something like that uh from from growing up for sure um so rob kind of moved us into the now um of the story where the bulk of the action happens um it should be mentioned that uh amelia and and perhaps the women in her family have a little bit of a, of a psychic ability. I don't feel that it plays a huge part in the book, but more of like their ability to like have like premonition type dreams. Would that be a fair way to put it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And she has had dreams about a, a large black man who we are also introduced to in the now. And his name is Lucius Tremaine. Um, he has a little bit of a history um, which he should probably, uh, you know, spend uh, some time under the radar, which he mostly does. But he gets into a, a, a situation with a, a, an asshole cop um, in in New Orleans, and uh, that that turns into a situation where he is forced to flee New Orleans and decides he is going to make his way to Texas, um, kind of in the general direction that Amelia and her her family are are, are in. It's not easy going for that dude. Um, I like the depiction of him uh, when you're first introduced to him as a character is just this guy who 
doesn't want to talk to anybody is keeping to himself like the epitome of under the radar but like you know trouble just comes knocking um with what Libya said so he's on the run and again he's just trying to keep a low profile but like you know um he finds a diner a black diner um and when he goes to pay apparently someone picked up on the fact that he had like a little bit of a chunk of a, a chunk of money in his sock and so he gets he gets kind of ambushed by by a group of people outside of town he uh demonstrates that he's pretty good at so it's like six on one and um he he hits the ground running cuts cuts some somebody on their on their face you know mm-hmm. and and it, the it's looking good for him in the beginning but then someone pulls a gun and actually shoots him and so um that kind of puts the end to him being um being on top of that fight he ends up kind of fleeing into the forest and so he's gut shot and um it, it just doesn't get any better for him from there and um after multiple gunshots he's just kind of stumbling around trying to find some way to not die like figure out how he can find someone to to help patch him up um so not a really good not a fun start for our boy lucius no so the um like I said, that kind of second part of the book kind of flips back and forth uh, back in Amelia's life. And again, this we're not even really straying outside the synopsis with this. Um, Arnold has gotten himself into some trouble. Uh, um, and this leaves uh, Amelia, without going into too much detail, in a situation where uh, the children, uh, there's not enough food. The children, you know, are, are children. And that, that's a certain set of obstacles that, that she has to try and overcome. But essentially, it's a uh, it's tough going for her, and eventually, eventually, these two will cross paths, as you know, is kind of indicated from the fact that she has dreams about this guy. So that's uh, I don't know if there's anything else plot wise we should really be going into. So another character that's pretty crucial to the story, and he's mentioned in the synopsis as her first love, who is now the local sheriff. Um, after the stuff that happened, where uh, his his family. Uh, I'm sorry, where Amelia's family doesn't want him around when they were teenagers and then she gets married. He he still kind of has this kind of flame for her. So even though she's married and she's got a family, he, you know, keeps an eye out on her. And when when uh, her husband is occasionally thrown into jail for being a drunk or being a, a crook, um, he'll like leave groceries on her porch and stuff like that. So he's this lingering presence just at the edge of her life he's approached her a couple of times and made overtures but she's very uh serious about her wedding vows because she's religious and it's the time you know where you know the vow is sacred and so i can't i know my husband's basically the biggest piece of garbage but i made a vow so i'm following it so we've got billy who is always there caring about what's happening in her life but not really a part of her life and he becomes pivotal, uh, obviously, toward the end um, when everything kind of like the looming explosion that's mentioned in the synopsis is is about to happen. Yes, yes, and yes. Um, I think we're going to cut it off there from plot, right? Yeah, from there it is. You've got these, yeah, you've got all of this craziness that's, you know, going to boil over one way or another here's the thing so uh, i did not read the synopsis before i read the book because i don't need to it's less edgerton i don't care what he writes i'm I'm probably going to read it um from the synopsis it seems like it's really easy to go to the end of this book so i'll go back to the synopsis will lucius make it to houston you know from reading the synopsis, you go, well, probably, right? Or we wouldn't be talking about it. Can Amelia save her children from both starvation and Arnold's increasing vegetable violence? Yeah, probably, right? As the odds stack up, you know, she's got to summon all her courage, right? We, we see all this. And, and you're pretty sure that you can pretty accurately predict what happens in this book. And I'm not going to say that you're wrong about it. What I am going to say is that this book takes some very surprising turns um, in a way that takes a book that, just from the synopsis, you go, okay, I, I get it. I get the story. But the way the story is delivered is is far better than what you think from the synopsis. Would you agree with that? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So my point is, 
you pretty much got the plot. You probably did need us to tell you about the plot to kind of see this. All I can say is that there are a number of times this book where I go, well, goddamn, or holy shit, or you know what I mean? And and that's um, that's really good to do for something that at least on its face seems predictable. Yeah, and let's talk about a couple of things. This book, um, I don't know what it's listed on Amazon. We have the, I got a paper um, advanced copy, and it's 175 pages. It's not a big tome, so everything he does, he does in less than 200 pages. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, like, uh, we've told you the general kind of uh, skeleton of the plot, um, and I hinted at, like, how dire the story was at the beginning. But one thing I will say is, like, he does not hesitate to make his characters suffer. Um, if there's one thing that is, and it's not cruel or gratuitous, it's showing, it's it's life laid bare, I guess is the best way to say it. Like, he doesn't spo- like spare the reader um, the real life trauma that people go through. Um, but he also doesn't do it in a gratuitous way. It's just like... Um, I mean, sometimes there's a little flair here or there where it's like, okay, that was, um, that that was darker than maybe it needed to be. But like for the for the most part, he basically just shows you this real dire, grim life that Amelia is going through, and all of the kind of chaotic characters that are contributing to like just making her life not good. Yeah. You you did that very masterfully, by the way. Um, (laughs) Thanks. Yeah. The, the darkness in this book definitely doesn't let up, um, which, which makes it an interesting read. And and there's something that, man, there's something I want to talk about. um, And and I would, if we were doing spoiler talk, Um, but so anyway, I, I, there's things I can't talk about. All I can say is that um, overtly and subtly, the the darkness of um, this particular town and this particular family and life in that area is conveyed in in really some gut wrenching ways. And, and I mean, again, I go back to hey, you read the synopsis, sounds fine. Th- this book delivers far more than than the synopsis even you know touches on. Yeah, and and um, I, I would say that it. I fully agree, and one of the things that I feel is the strongest uh, parts of this book is uh, character relationships, whether they're uh, good or hopeful or positive relationships. Um, you know, between Amelia and her kids, or or you know, like the the teenage love of Billy and Amelia and stuff, or the really bad ones like. Arnold and Amelia or her, you know, her family not being, you know, as good as they could have been and stuff like that. Uh, even when Lucius comes along and how he interacts with the, the people that he does, um, the interplay and the relationship between characters is somehow really well done, even though, again, he doesn't like, there's not a lot of flair to it. It's just very... I, it, that's I think that's like the the trick for me is like he did so much of this book so well without like overdoing or underdoing it's just so well written and um like you care about the characters and if 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 Amelia if you know she made a choice that was you know harmful for her her or her family like you felt it when she felt it so um I guess what I'm saying is that he's just wrote really, really good characters and he wrote the way that their relationships played out really well. And so, um, I think mean, he just fucking wrote everything. Well, I guess I could just say that <laughs> it would be a shorter way to say it for sure. Um, <laughs> but yes, yeah, absolutely. And it, it's stunning. Cause I mean, I, I knew how many pages it was. I, I it's, it's just, it's a lot of story for that few pages and that's just obviously what a tactful writer does right like a lot of times there's times where i complain about the length of something i think things should have been explored more and that's not the case in this 180 ish page novel yeah so 
uh, yeah, I mean, we you know we're not going to go into spoiler talk. Um, a, it's not a big book, and B, um, I don't think that there's anything that we need to kind of hash out or like interpret. It's it's very what you see is what you get. Um, as far as a story goes, it's just the thing that makes it a good story is how well he wrote what you see. <laughs> For sure. And with that, I am going to go um, to wrap ups. Um, I, I mean, I don't know what else I can say. Um, Les Edgerton is a brilliant storyteller, and we've had a lot of fun with everything, um, including a memoir, which, as Rob said, one of only two in the hundreds of, uh, of books that we've read. Um, it's a good story. I mean, it really felt like a, like a good look at, at, a, at a particular part of our country during a particular time. Um, and really, at, at least for this family, a particularly dark time. And from my experience in small communities, um, rural communities like this, um, you know, it felt like uh, it felt very genuine and also very, very dark. Um, the characters are pretty well fleshed out, although there's not a lot of time spent because as we said, it's like 176 pages, so you can't spend a lot of time on, on developing characters. So it's done tactfully and it's done very well. Um, it's it's one of the more brutal books we've read, and that's saying a lot. And I think, you know, we may have read books that were more, um, you know, vulgar or, uh, you know, more gross or, or whatever. But the, this is one of the few that, that really delivered that type of darkness and impact in a book that's um, that's trying to be a very realistic story and not, you know, a horror novel or or whatever, some kind of weird, bizarre book that, that we reviewed. Um, all in all, I, I think that with the exception of how really dark it can be at times, this is a book that, that it could, could see a really, really wide audience. Um, and overall, after breaking down the all the categories and, and rating them individually, I'm coming out at 8.5 on this one. Great book. Hmm. Yeah, we've we've uh, we've praised the book already, and we've uh, already looked into some of the things that I think are so good about it. I would say that um, Les Edgerton is a great writer, and um, he managed to pack a huge story into. Um, a pretty slim book overall. I really appreciated the way that he developed and created interplay with the characters. Like I said before, um, it's just, I marvel at the fact that he made life. So what did I say before? It's life laid bare. So he didn't do, it wasn't dramatic or theatrical the way that it was grim or dark or violent. It was just realistic. And, um, so it was almost like you were like, watching one of those like um kind of documentary series on netflix or something like that it had that feel of just being um almost like true to life but uh for the most part there's one thing me and livius joked about <laughs> uh but otherwise <laughs> he does this incredible job of just laying out a story that doesn't need to rely on um crazy uh tropes or uh, over the top characters or uh, action scenes or unrealistic things, the story survives on the fact that it itself is compelling, and um, uh, it, it was just it was very well done. I gave really high marks to almost all of the categories. Um, the tone, obviously, I thought, um, despite the fact that it was really dark and grim and challenged you for the fact that it was as dark and grim as it was, was excellently done i think the characters like i said before were very well done um and in general uh it's this is probably one of the few ratings that i gave a perfect score for personal score because uh it just uh it just did it just came out so well it really hit me and obviously like at the end i cried livia so you don't have to worry about wondering that happened uh <laughs> <laughs> so overall, I gave the I gave the book eight point seven five out of ten. Uh, that gives the podcast score eight point six two five. And now that my wrap up is over, there's I want to just read something that someone much more succinctly uh, wrote about this book. Uh, I went over to the Amazon page for this book, and Scott Phillips uh, blurbed this book. And it hits some of the things that I was trying to say earlier that I feel like I was maybe struggling with a little bit. He said, Hard Times is the best country noir 
I've read in a long while, a knife-edged, cold-eyed story of love and hate at their most visceral. It's worthy of a place of pride on the shelf next to William Gay and Daniel Woodrell. So, high praise, but also like it hits some of those things that I think are so important about why this is a good book. Knife-edged, cold-eyed, story of love and hate at their most visceral, I think is a really uh, apt way of describing the book. Absolutely. And I don't know if there were any other name drops. I, I only caught one in there. Do you know what I'm talking oh, about? Oh, uh, uh, who was it? I remember it was like the first and last name. It's a East, East Texas guy, Joe Lansdale. Joe Lansdale. That's what it was. Yep. 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 So as a, as a passing, <laughs> as a passing character, um, which was, which was a nice, uh, a nice little treat. So, um, it's funny and, and we could continue to talk about this, but I, I just pulled up, um, our next, book and exactly exactly in the same vein as this one oddly enough we're going to be reviewing lamb the gospel according to biff christ childhood pal so i don't know how we could have segued any better from one book to another <laughs> yeah I-, I like the timing of it right yeah well right between anxious people and lamb <laughs> yeah. we sandwich in this this just really <laughs> fucked up book yeah so yeah it's i i it's I'm glad because, like you said, it, it's fucked up. That's my review. I'm glad we got to give people a little bit more because it is fucked up, but like it's also fucked up how good it is. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> without a doubt. Um, and we will be having Les Edgerton on, I believe, uh, about a week from now or so, but uh, definitely in the near future. It's always fun to talk to Les. And, uh, you know, we have some questions like, what the fuck is wrong with you, man? So we, we've got some questions to ask him uh, about this per, this particular one. So, one thing I'd like to point out about this book, um, he mentions it in his uh, acknowledgments at the end, but uh, this is one of the first titles on a newer press called Bronzeville Books, and um, one of the things he says in his acknowledgments is. Uh, my name's on the cover, but this novel would not be possible without the help of a lot of other people. Among those, I first include Danny Gardner, who said I was the first writer he approached for his new press and signed me before he even signed his own book. So um, uh, that's that's less. He he makes an impression on people. Yeah, I mean, they certainly could have done a lot worse um, <laughs> with with a first book, a lot worse. So, so we're raving about less a little bit. Anybody who's interested in. Um, other stuff like i said you could dig back into our catalog and um listen to our reviews of the rapist and bomb but uh last year uh at the beginning of 2019 so it was close to two years ago i guess um we did review his memoir adrenaline junkie that's episode 427 um and it's weird to talk about a memoir because you can't judge like the characters or the narrative it's it's a guy talking about his life um but we did an incredible interview with him episode 429 which was like mid-january of 2019 um where he's just very open about his life and his experiences and being a criminal and being a a, like a an award-winning hairstylist and going into writing and the man just has um it has the kind of life where if you were to try and summarize his life to someone they'd be like bullshit that's not a person um (laughs) but it happened and and it's just very entertaining uh, but also interesting to hear him talk about all he's been through so um i would absolutely recommend if you're looking f- to hear more about him yeah definitely dip back to episode 429 and hear us talk about his life and and the stuff that was in his memoir yeah and then come back and hear some more because that's what we're going to be doing for um I'm not sure if exactly if it's going to be our next episode but it's going to be right around our next episode so I mentioned it already. Um, the holidays are coming up really quickly, and we will have a holiday episode. But Rob had the perfect suggestion for uh, for the holidays. So the particular holiday I'm talking about is Christmas. And for those of you that don't know, that's when um, Jesus Christ was born. Um, and we are going to go in the Wayback Machine a book that Rob and I both read long before we started this podcast. I mean, I'll be honest, one of the highlights of the podcast was getting this author on to, to talk to him about it. It was a bucket list item for, for both of us, and we were able to do that um, earlier this year. 
Um, but yeah, Lamb by Christopher Moore, which uh, for those of you that don't know, is a very tongue in cheek um, story about Biff, who has been systematically erased from the scriptures. But he is Christ's pal. He is he is a kid that grew up alongside Jesus. And we get to see um, the story of, of Jesus Christ through the eyes of his buddy Biff. Um, I picked this up. I vividly remember I picked this up um, in a bookstore, had a little bit of time to kill, probably got about three or four pages in and said, all right, I have to buy this book and read it. And I probably finished it the next day. Um, definitely one of the funniest books. Yeah, here's a spoiler review. We fucking love this book. I expect it's going to give very high marks, <laughs> um, but a, a great way to kind of take us into the holiday season. And, and thanks to Rob for having the idea. Yeah, uh, I did the, I I did this one for you, but I also did it because I was talking to um, um, I've been dating someone for a while, and so we talk about the podcast as you know almost exclusively. It's uh, that's all I'll let her talk about. And uh, God, that would make me a terrible person. <laughs> that was kind yeah, it's of tough though, man, because you come across <laughs> these podcast groupies, and what yeah. else are you supposed to do? Right. Uh, but no, it came up that we like one of the things that's challenging about um, doing this podcast and, and having done it for so long is that we don't necessarily read like the um, the big work from an author. We just read what they wrote most recently. And it even came up when we were talking to Christopher Moore or talking about his book is the whole like it'll never be good as lamb. So uh, we didn't have a book prepared. We, and I knew we were going to read at least one or two more books for the year. And I was like, I happened to be sitting on my couch. Christopher Moore's books are really close to the couch. And I looked over and I was like, no, oh, we do lamb. Like then we will have talked about his, uh, his absolutely most popular book. And um, it'll be fun for us because we get to relive a story that we both enjoyed. Um, and it's timing is perfect. Uh, you know, it, it's good for the holidays. So it all just lined up, but I, I like the idea of um, not having to just read the stuff that they did most recently. Like we can dive back into the past and read kind of their most acclaimed book or the thing that, that started them or whatever, the thing that people talk about. We read Haruki Murakami's 1Q84, which is basically like a 900 page piece of garbage. Um, but everybody talks about the Wind Up Bird Chronicle and how awesome it is. And we'll probably never read that. But had we done that instead, we might have a different idea of Haruki Murakami. I'm not opposed to doing it. I think I tried to read that, that book, though, if I'm being honest, like like even before 1Q84. Because, <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, the literary world is funny. And I'm not, like, saying, like, we're part of the literary world. But some people, they're like, oh, Haruki Murakami. And no one ever says a negative thing. Our experience was bad. My other experience, right. and I don't remember if it was that book or not, was not great. I don't, I didn't finish it. Um, But, you know, people will look down their nose at you if you should talk Haruki Murakami. And uh, I think we've done that a mm -hmm. lot. So I almost feel like we should go back to the well and do it again at some point. You know, something just occurred to me because I was talking about... um. Uh, I've been dating someone and you want me to you want me to blow your hair back. Uh, so you remember we read a David Foster Wallace book. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and I'm assuming you probably wouldn't want to go back and read a different David Foster <laughs> Wallace book, right? I mean, fuck, I don't want to read that crazy one with the, the other one. It's like a thousand pages, right? It makes no sense. Yeah. Like his famous one. Yeah, I don't know about that. I mean, I'm not, look, there's nothing I'm super opposed to reading, if I'm being honest. I'm willing to give everything a shot. She's read Infinite Jest multiple times. Oh, I was my like, God. Uh, that, like, uh, it just, when I, I talked to, a long time ago, I worked for a newspaper, and one of the people I worked with um, had read the book, and when she's like, oh, yeah, you should read it, if you got a few months all right. To be fair, we would probably have to set aside three weeks. It's a thousand pages. And both you and I are very comfortable with like a one week turnaround on like a 350 page book. Right. So we would need we would need a month, I think. Yeah. Uh, oh, I don't want to do it. Um, OK. I'm just very impressed that that she was she managed to not only read it, but get through it more than more than once. I think three times. Wow. It's pretty pretty bonkers so i'm impressed What's, with it's nice to date someone where you can be impressed with how much they read or how how capable they are of reading what's the um what's what's the longest book you read do you think 
probably one Q eight four. One Q eight four. But that, that was like nine hundred pages, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say I've got a couple that are around that. Um, I feel like the stand is right around that. Yeah, I was gonna say Stephen King books tend to be long, but I yeah. hadn't really read many of those. Yeah. Um, Atlas Shrugged is probably the longest book I've read because not only is it like 900 something pages, it's the smallest fucking type you can put on a page. It's like a three yeah. font or something ridiculous. Um, yeah, you know what? Books like that can, can go one of two ways. Sometimes they're, they're written well enough that, that you don't mind, but yeah, it's so tough to do when, like I said, you're typically looking at a one to two week turnaround committing to, to something of that scope is, uh, is tough. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, the all we have to do is read Lamb. So uh, <laughs> that's so much easier. It's true. That's true. And we like we already know what we're getting. So right. this is this is going to be a cakewalk of a of a week for for us here at Booked. Yep, absolutely. I'm excited. All right. Um, I, I believe I believe we have a couple other small things um, before we move on with this. Well, one thing, and this this is something I, I want to acknowledge first that we don't typically talk about the the pandemic that we're going through right now um covid doesn't really enter into what we talk about and we're absolutely not any kind of experts on any of that stuff but um and and i think i at least for myself i'm gonna knock on wood somehow um i've managed to stay pretty protected from any of the the worst effects of it um nobody close to me um has has had it or I've, i haven't lost someone to it but uh someone that we really respect lost their mother recently uh zoya stage and it, it's one of those things where like you know we've talked to her a few times we've had some good conversations but i think we really respect her and um nobody should go through that but especially since like she's such a good person and we've had such great interactions with her like it just felt like it, it just felt really awful to see that because you don't want anybody to go through that. And she's, she's a very good person. So, um, yeah, my condolences. Yes, absolutely. That's, um, that's terrible. And, and, uh, we hope you're doing okay. If you happen to hear this, <sighs> anything else? We got any other downers we want to, we want to go on with her. Um, I don't, I don't want to end on a downer. We've actually like, we've talked about a really grim book and um you know obviously zoya's loss is is an awful thing but i don't want to go out on a downer i do want to however say um something nice happened recently and that's uh that's you had a birthday so i want to wish you a happy birthday i hope you had an awesome time i hope you were able to celebrate in some socially distanced res- res- responsible way um Thank you. And yes, the, as long as I keep having birthdays, that is a good thing. Because <laughs> because the, the part where I don't have a birthday one year is a terrible, terrible uh, uh, thing to, to happen. Um, yeah, I, I had a good time. Um, it, it, it's tough. You know, my uh, my mother messed me on my birthday and she said something like, I hope you're doing something special. And I like, what? <laughs> like what? There's there's nothing to do. So right. I, I, I did. I did very much enjoy my birthday in like the lowest key way possible so thank you and uh and yes it was a good one i hope to squeeze out a few more um we'll we'll see how that goes jesus hopefully a lot more than a few yeah um, i know that's you said you didn't want to end on a downer i was like how can i bring <laughs> this down let me let me do it like this so wow. um yeah yeah 40 48 for anybody who's counting and the reason i say that is i was pretty sure that i was already 48 for a period of time i was thinking this is my 49th birthday and then you know quick glance at the calendar one day i was like no wait no, no, I'm only gonna be 48. So it's 48. funny. It's funny how we do that. Sometimes we just like, you know, we just say we're the we're the next age. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I I've been gr- guilty of that so many times. Like, when I probably when I was 38, I started saying I was 40. Yeah. Oh, you skipped a whole year. Yeah, you do that less and less the older you get. I think. <laughs> Maybe I was doing two years back then too. Hey, you know, <laughs> does this ever happen to you though? It's so. Our, our birth date is probably the date we know the best, right? And I was thinking this year about how weird it always looks to see it, like the the um, date on my clock in the car. Like, like, hey, it, like I have this feeling because whenever I see that date, it's I've just told it to somebody, right? They're like date of birth. I'm like 12, 72. Um, 
it almost feels like the radio knows it's my birthday, but really it's just another date. Like anybody else looks at it and it's just whatever day, like how I look at, you know, whatever, you know, July 20th or something. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, you know what I mean? No. Well, the thing for me, um, so yes, I think it, it is weird to see it. Um, but the thing for me was, so my birthday is October 8th. And, um, I don't know if you ever knew about this or noticed this, but, um, so like before everybody used their cell phone, uh, people actually used, they actually bought alarm clocks, like a clock specifically to wake you up mm-hmm. and, um, digital alarm clocks always had 10 Oh eight was the time displayed on the digital alarm clock packaging. Um, Oh, that's so, weird. No, I never noticed that. Yeah. So uh, with an analog clock, it's um, 10, 10 or whatever, because, you know, that way the arms are kind of splayed outward and, mm-hmm. you know, made the whole watch face visible or the clock face visible or whatever. But on digital clocks, it was almost always 1008 that you would see on the packaging on the outside or like the little sticker they put in, in front of the display. And so, and like, especially having worked in like, big box stores and grocery stores in my younger life, I fucking saw 1008 mm-hmm. all the time. And so I think my mind just kind of like built a, like a blind spot around it. Yeah. Yep. Because of, because of that. That's interesting. But yeah, but see, so at some point you understood what I was saying. Oh yeah. You know totally. what I mean? Like it. Yeah. And you're like, was, oh, <laughs> this, this means something to me, but yeah, it doesn't mean anything to anybody. Else. It, it was yeah. like, for me, it was like the, the movie, the number 23, like mm-hmm. I just fucking yep. saw it everywhere, and I was like, I yeah. turned into Jim Carrey. Yep. And also, um, I should acknowledge friend of the podcast, John Gatwood, also his birthday. That's um, right. You guys I have mean, the same. A couple days ago, on the seventh. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, you guys have the same birthday. If, uh, you guys are like two halves of a whole. I think. Like it's it's creepy how much. So, for listeners, John is is a friend that I grew up with, um, as as young as the third grade, and we've stayed friends all these years. Um, and Livius, arguably, you know, probably the closest person I've had in an adult life, right? Um, we because the last decade we've been doing this, mm-hmm. so like we are kind of inextricably linked to each other. Um, but it's just it's uncanny how how similar Livius and John are, down to like, uh, you know, vaping and stuff like that. So yeah, you guys are pretty much the same. So person. similar down to vaping and stuff like that <laughs> all i all i all i know is i hope you know how lucky you are to have two people like that in your life well most people don't even get one <laughs> that's true that is true with all the vaping <laughs> and stuff with the vaping and stuff um yeah. i want to say before we wrap things up because i feel like we're going in that direction uh hard times by less edrogen is out now it is available in hardcover paperback or kindle so go buy that thing because um we really liked it, and so did Scott Phillips. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So if you don't take our word for it, take Scott Phillips' word for it. <laughs> All right. Come back next week for um, Lamb by Christopher Moore, an interview with Les Edgerton, maybe Infinite Jest. Who knows? But next week, all that <laughs> stuff coming your way. All right. That's going to wrap it up for this episode. Until next time, I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livia Snudden. Keep reading. <laughs>